Welcome, everybody, to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette. We're so glad you're with us today to stay curious. Beside me is Gary Allgaier. Hi, Gary. How you doing there, Mark? How you? Well, Pleasure good. to be here again. Well, a nice, as I'm adjusting the cord there, nice little serendipity out at the Space Center today, meeting Marty and Bill Whiting were out there, and uh, we weren't meeting each other. We just happened to be up there. I didn't really know what the show was going to be. Uh, started thinking Apollo 9 for Friday, but thought Apollo 9 day is today, 55 years ago. And there's Gary being a docent. Yeah. Come on board, Gary, and let's help us talk about the and a, a mission that the great launch uh, control director, Gene Kranz, called Sheer Exhilaration. A near-perfect mission. Everybody in NASA very happy that the lunar module worked uh almost flawlessly did, built yes. by Grumman and that the command module built by North American also did what it was supposed to do in the docking phases uh, 55 years ago. It this was, was also, a, also the first time we launched a Saturn V, a full up Saturn V with the lunar module and the command module. Good point. That was March 3rd, 1969. And can you believe it? In uh, uh, May, we uh, barnstormed the moon on Apollo 10 within 10 miles, and then in eight, uh, July, we're landing on yeah, the moon just great. five months after this yes. event today. It, it's incredible. And 55 years ago passed pretty quick. Well, that yeah, it does, but back then, it seemed like a long time between those missions. <laughs> it seemed like it was forever, but boy. It seemed like that, Artemis missions. Yeah, well, <laughs> a year, a oh, year or more apart. Whoops. A oh, little yeah. dig there for me on the yeah. Artemis program, yeah. but uh, Gary, tell everybody what you did during the Apollo program. Well, I was a mechanical engineer, and I worked. Did the uh, we did our office was responsible for the mating operations that we would do uh, with the command module, the service module, and then we had another group that uh, two other engineers in our group worked the lunar module for the same type of a thing that we did. Uh, and then I also at, this is the first time we actually used the docking probe and drove. And then we performed a docking test uh, for that mission. That was the first time we actually mated the lunar module to the Apollo spacecraft in the altitude chamber. And uh, we're going to show a few pictures of that. Yes. Uh, yeah. Gary's got some great shots uh, of the couches in the Apollo command module. Very interesting to see details of those. There was a special alteration made for the Irishman, yeah. James McDivitt, we're going to talk about yeah. there. And uh, we're also going to show you our um, some items that you can buy from Apollo 9 at our auction this Saturday, okay? Uh, but first, I want to say hi to Marty Winkle. He worked on LEM number three for Grumman, and this is the ascent stage behind us coming back up. Uh, welcome, Marty. How are you today? Uh, wonderful, Mark. How are you? Well, good. Uh, that I find, yeah, I am wonderful. Uh, woke up this morning wondering how all this happened to me and going out to the Space Center, seeing uh, an astronaut, uh, a Piper, Heidi Piper, what an awesome lady she is, and um, got a few autog things autographed for the museum. And we put this program together here, and you're going to really enjoy it. I pulled out some pictures you might never seen before of the astronauts in the spaceship uh, on Flickr. We're also going to show you, like I said, items you can buy at our auction Saturday uh, from Apollo 9. And Marty, what we have this picture here is the first time a vehicle has had human beings aboard it that could not return to Earth. The lunar module, this is the ascent stage of it after they got rid of the, the, the descent stage with the legs on it. So uh, quite a, a, a daring mission. A very important mission. Uh, 55 years ago. Imagine you're separating away from the command module that had David Scott inside, Rusty Schweiker, and Commander Jim McDivitt are saying bye-bye. And if something messes up, we don't have a heat shield on this to come home. Yeah. We're, well, we're, we're done if we can't get back inside that command module. Right. Uh, astronauts never thought about things like that, though, like, they we may did. have trained if something had happened. I don't know if they could have gotten the command module within the distance of the, of the lunar module if the engines did not fire to bring them back up. Mm -hmm. they, they may have trained for that. 
uh, an exterior uh, transfer there. Yeah, Marty. And so Jim McDivitt and Rusty Swanken now became the first astronauts or first humans to fly totally in a space vehicle. Designed only to fly in a vacuum of space. That's right. Designed to land on another world. And they were standing up. Uh, Marty, why didn't they put seats in there? Why? <laughs> they're, they're in zero G right now. And they're on the moon. They're in one-sixth gravity. Yeah. yeah. They, didn't need, they didn't need to sit down to fly. I don't think they have any room for them either. And, well, uh, and the weight, save weight, weight, big, big weight, weight saver too. But, yeah, they had, uh, there was room for it. It was more like a, like a stool. But it was just excess weight you didn't need. Uh huh. Yeah, they wouldn't think about that today in there. So, well, let's look through some of the stuff we put together here on okay. this 55th double nickel anniversary of Apollo 9. We do have two of the three astronauts are still with us. Uh, and um, and um, fortunately, we lost um, Jim McDivitt in October 2022 at the age of 93, though. So let's remind you all that our charity auction is Saturday, noon to 5 o'clock. You can hit that QR code, and it'll take you to the website, Invaluable, where Bid Again Auctions has loaded up 360-plus lots, everything, and they're in chronological order, Gary. So if you're just interested in Mercury and Gemini, watch it the first hour. If you just want shuttle stuff, shuttle stuff is the last couple hours of it. Okay. So. It's about uh, a, a lot a minute with 300 lots. Yeah, you're looking at 360 lots. You're looking at five to six hours to have it done. Wow. So uh, the shuttle stuff will come up about four hours in, uh, about 2.30, uh, 1, 1.30, 2 o'clock is when you're going to get into the Apollo stuff. Chuck Jeffrey, our board member who owner of Bid Again Auctions and has been doing this. Uh, he's in it's about the 28th, 29th auction we've done. And these are important to sustain our museum. And Gary, you want to own a Rocketdyne engine? Uh, you could own one for about $100,000. Well, I'll see if I got $100,000 in the, in, in the bank yeah. account. Yeah. Load that on a two-wheeler and just scorch your way around <laughs> Bike Week here yeah. on that. So anyway, Bid Again Auctions load it up on our website you'll see the auction tab up there or hit this qr code it's a very educational thing to watch you can i watch it on my smartphone uh it's you know there's going to be some bargains you're going to have some apollo astronaut autographs go for just maybe just a hundred bucks and they should oh, go wow. for a couple hundred but well let's kick off here the crew jim mcdivitt on the bottom there he died at age 93 born in chicago uh he had 14 days of space, Gemini 4, and after the Apollo 9 mission, he became the manager of the whole Apollo program. So he about took a bigger check and a lot more headaches. But some of these astronauts, he could have walked on the moon. Yes, yes he uh, could For have. sure. But some of them just say, I've had enough, and my family's had enough, is, is, is what I've been told. That is true. They, uh, especially for the shuttle, the uh, some of the astronauts realize that it's very very hard on their wives going into space and they just didn't want to put them through that pressure anymore mm -hmm. well in the middle there's david scott he's 91 going to be 92 and uh on june 6th he's one of four moonwalkers alive of course buzz aldrin is 94 of apollo 11 you've got uh harrison schmidt of apollo 17 is 88 and um He's going to be 89 this year. And the youngest moonwalker is Charlie Duke, who's 88. He's going to be 89 in July. So, I mean, October for Charlie. David Scott is uh, a commander of Apollo 15. He did one stand, he did five stand up EVAs on this Apollo 9 mission. And then he did once the famous one stand up EVA on the moon uh, on Apollo 15, and then three EVAs with the rover. Uh, with his moonwalking late buddy, uh, Jim Irwin. And then Rusty Schweikert on the right, born, uh, he's 88, born in 1935, October 25th. What city in New Jersey was Rusty Schweikert born in? Hint, there's a planet named after this city. I don't know. Well, Neptune. Oh, Neptune. Okay. He's born in Neptune, New Jersey. New Jersey. I'll be darned. Uh, he had an hour and 15 minute stand up EVA outside the lunar module to test the Apollo spacesuit 
on this. We're going to see some pictures of Rusty here in the museum back in November when he was here with Jack Swiker doing an autograph session for the Skylab DVD. There's the launch. There's the crew command module there. Yes. He was here with Lauso. Who did I say? Swiker. Oh. Who you said. Well, yeah, he was your Jack Lausma. Uh, they, he was about 88 years old also. Here's the star players 55 years ago, the command module and the lunar module. Now, Gary, they just couldn't say Apollo 9. They had to come up with a radio code. That's true. And those were? Gumdrop and Spider. Yeah, for logical reasons yes. there. The command module yes. looks like a gumdrop and Spider there. Uh, Marty will point out, if you would, Marty, the only way you know right away if you don't see the Earth in the background is this is a is lem number three on Apollo nine because yes, right there is a dot is the landing probe five foot landing probe right below the ladder, and they didn't want that to stick out so it'd be in the way of an astronaut going down the ladder so those do not appear. On the moon landing right. lands, when it there. when it touched the ground, those were actually bent upwards and pointing up, with, and they would have interfered with them coming down the ladder. And a blue contact light, Grumman Blue, came on, and uh, uh, there was a button that that has that uh, symbolizes that. Okay. There you are with Rusty Schweiker. Yes. Which what were y'all talking about there? Well, we were talking about my famous. Uh, let me get it here. We changed out, because Jim McDivitt was Irish, uh, Rockwell wanted to honor his, because everything he's ever flown in had a green, something green in the cockpit. And so uh, the Rockwell engineer came to our office and we negotiated uh, changing out his levers and, and knobs in the, on his couch uh, prior to the mission was launched. And uh, so I never under, I never got a closure of what happened to them after they came back and they looked at the in San Diego where the Aerospace Museum where the his command module was, they were back to being gold. And then I just asked him what happened to them because I thought Jim McDivitt had got them or hope he had, and evidently Jim McDivitt did, and he gave Rusty one of the latches so he has one of the green ones i assume he gave dave scott the other side of the couch that we'll see uh, uh pictures so, of that uh, that barrio point yeah. out there so this is off of the this is actually off of jim mcdivitt's couch uh on the apollo 9 mission it is not worth a penny because it did not fly uh-huh well how about this one i have here <laughs> that's 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 jim mcdivitt's right there yeah. i think all right. No, I found that. This is a trailer hitch. Uh, no, <laughs> oh, there's something I found in the well, road. When I found that, I thought about you because I thought, well, we'll probably talk yeah. about that one day. But how cool is that? That's worth yeah. a, uh, I'll give you 20 bucks for it. No, it's not for sale. <laughs> Marty, how much would you give him for it? <laughs> I'll give him the penny he, he asked for. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Well, then we're going to see a picture of that here in yeah. a minute, but we really enjoyed this gentleman. He's very intelligent. He knows a lot about space international law. He is part, he helped found the Asteroid Day that's going to celebrate 10 okay. years on June 30th, Asteroid Day, when a comet or meteor blew up over Tunguska, uh, Siberia, and leveled hundreds of trees, thousands of acres yeah. of trees. Uh, it's not a case of when, if, but when. An yeah. asteroid could wipe us out like it did the dinosaurs 65 right. million yeah. years ago. Uh, so uh, he's he's all involved with that and was here with Jack Schweiker. I mean, Rust, uh, with uh, Rusty Schweiker. Jack Lausma yeah. uh, on a book signing there. So, well, let's get into this mission here a little bit. We've got the uh, patch. I want to read you the uh, information about the uh, patch of Apollo 9. Uh, the gumdrop and spider, the Apollo 9 mission was the first to have its crew test both Apollo spacecraft, the command module, and the lunar module. The patch includes a Saturn V rocket, the command module, and lunar module in station keeping lunar orbit. The blue background represents Earth. This being an Earth orbit mission, and you might wonder why is the D colored red? 
Well, the red interior of the D in McDivitt signifies it is the D mission in the alphabetical sequence of pre-lunar landing missions. This patch was designed by Alan Stevens of North American Aviation. So, uh, launched March 3rd, 69 at 11 a.m., the full-up Saturn V, first time with an operating lunar module on it. And, uh, of course, Apollo 8 uh, had done that earlier uh, with a, without the lunar module. And Apollo uh, 7 uh, used the... Um, uh, S1B. S1B. Yeah. yeah. So uh, they had to name the, the vehicles for radio purposes there. So that broke the the mold from the Gemini days of just, just saying the Gemini call letters. It there. would have been interesting instead of putting the red dot if they had put a green dot for, for Gemini. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. Uh, D, the D, uh, they, uh, they never did the E missions. They went right to the F, the lunar landing simulations there we're going to see two of these patches that are for auction over a hundred dollars each and we'll explain to you why what a classic photograph the bubble helmets like that uh, they don't make spacesuits like that anymore no do they? no i always impressed with those i thought they were really cool uh, back then when we saw them in real time yeah ilc dover yeah. uh made those uh the playtex uh, corporation mm -hmm. seamstresses is who yeah. who built the fabrics there and there is a gumdrop where's where is it uh, on museum exhibit it's Harry? in the, it's in the uh, san diego air and space museum in, in san diego okay uh i hope to get out there sometime i hear that mm -hmm. is a fabulous museum mm -hmm. out there so well Pictures aren't always what they say they are. And this was labeled as Apollo 9. And when I showed this to Gary, he goes immediately, no, that's not Apollo 9. Looks like the altitude test chamber. Mm -hmm. And Gary goes, nope, it's not Apollo 9. And uh, Marty's nodding, too, that he probably realized it's not Apollo 9. What's the tip off? It doesn't have the docking probe in the uh, in the hatch area right there where the latches are at. With the plastic the over plastic there. Plastic over them, yeah. On the very top. All right. So this was probably? Uh, this could be Apollo, Apollo 8, okay. uh, more than likely, because they were they were in the building at the same time. Uh, when this Apollo 8 was finished coming out of the chamber, then we were bringing in Apollo 9 spacecraft from California, and it was coming in through, uh -huh. through the door for that. And what is an altitude test chamber? It's there's, there's two vacuum chambers. Uh, one's uh, dedicated to the Apollo spacecraft, and the other one's dedicated to the lunar module. And we set the spacecraft in there, and then we have, for us, we had two major tests. One was doing the altitude runs, where we would put the lid back on, put the crew in there, and do a complete, uh, pull as much vacuum as we could get. I think it was 177,000 feet altitude equivalent that we would put it to in that room in that to room get the... yes and of course everybody's out of the room and then the lunar module would also go through that same thing with two crew members in it but after, how long would the run be it would run probably all day long okay. uh, eight hours eight hours, hours because they would do a lot of the stuff that they were going to do on orbit and it's just to verify the integrity of the spacecraft everything was sealed up uh, and everything would work now this is in the altitude chamber and up and above on to just from the center to the left a little bit, that's where the astronauts would come in. That was on the third floor of the ONC building at the time. And their head and their, uh, their rooms that they had what they would, their kitchen and bedrooms when they were staying there. And their suit, the rooms where they would suit up and they would just walk down the hall go through a couple of doors and then in, into the altitude chamber. Mm -hmm. Now we would come in at the base and walk up a, a set of stairways to get to that area. Mm. But that's how the astronauts would get there. Well, and people are unfamiliar with that blue coating on the command module. That is a, a tape that's put over top of the Mylar because when they did the moon missions, they had the silver tape that was on them to help protect the, uh, the heat from the sun and radiate that out but to protect that we had it on here and we start pulling it off once we get to the pad okay well occasionally you see that at auctions for sale there mm -hmm. but uh not very often yeah, so it was thrown away so so the docking 
of these two spacecraft and the redocking uh, was yeah. the important test that everything works. So what are we looking at here, Gary? Now, th this this is an actual what a docking uh, test looks like. We have the silver area that you see is actually a flight lunar module. We take the ascent stage and we will rotate it without the descent stage upside down and then we will lower it over the command module and by will we use the weight of the lunar module to stroke the, the probe, the drogue down to where the latch is latched to, to the command module. This is uh, 55 years later. Yeah. This is what we're doing with the, the Crew Dragon uh, and uh, the Boeing Starliner, hopefully here at the end of next month, yeah, correct? Yeah. There's correct. There's been yeah. no real change in technology. No, there's not. Well, they use different systems. So this, they use more of the system that will be a, that we came out of the Apollo Soyuz test project. Okay. That's used on the shuttle. This was uh, would be incompatible going to the space station. But the concepts the are concept, the same. You concepts have to have are it. the same. There's a soft capture, then a then you have a hard capture. And the gentleman down there in the left hand corner, that's me. Oh. <laughs> All right. Far left corner there with the headset on. With that's you. Huh? All right. Just and a little peach fuzz on yeah, you. Yeah, and the gentleman on Is to the right. Is that Gunter? Pardon? Is that Gunner Venn on the right? No, that's his. That's name. His. That's Joe Funky. He was the engineer for the lunar module, and he came down to see the watch the test. Huh. Because actually, we do the testing, and and Grumman mm -hmm. just uh, what they did was they leveled the vehicle, so it was level, and then they brought it over, <laughs> and then they controlled the hydrosets that were when we lowered it because we couldn't put the full weight of the lunar module on the docking ring or on the command module. So we had to pull some pretty fancy equipment up there to make sure that we did. I think it was 5,000 pounds we were limited to hmm. out of the, what, 17 or 18,000 pounds that the ascent stage weighed. And we could only put 5,000 pounds on it. Plus we could never actually, when we pulled back out, we could not make sure that, we had to make sure that we didn't exceed a 5,000 pounds of on that area side of it. Was it noisy in that room or you had yeah, a headset on? We had headsets on without the lid on. It's not too bad. Uh, when, if you go in there, when they put the lid back on, we were in a domed area and people could whisper on one side of the room and you could hear that on, okay. on the other side. Like being in a telescope observatory yeah, like yeah, I have if you ever go out, If you go to Washington, D.C. and go where they have all the main room where they have all the statues. Uh huh. You can also hear that in right. there. Well, there's Gary on yeah. the far left there. Yeah. Boy, your outfit there, your uh, overalls, that'd sell for $1,000 on. Yeah, uh, I wish I still had on, it. Uh, I wish I had there. a lot of that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, talking to Eric, uh, Gary Allgaier here, structural engineer with the Apollo program, and then segued into the mm -hmm. shuttle. He's been on the show many times. What an expert uh, insight we get here. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're looking at the benches, we're looking at the head, looking down, and the feet are, are uh, up at the top up there. These are the couches. Uh, we're lucky to have a set of these. They're in, they're in dis on display somewhere, but I don't know exactly where. Marty's got a comment. I've got ashes from Bill, uh, Bill Whiting. Prior to moving to San Diego, the Apollo 9 command module was housed at the Michigan Space Center in Jackson, Michigan, hometown of Jim McDivitt and Al Warden. Oh, that's interesting. All right. I didn't Thank know you, that. Bill. Yeah. Thank you, Bill. If you got pictures of that, share them with us. Yeah. Uh, that's cool. Awesome. Uh, good. Thanks for chiming in there. That's... All right. Okay. We're looking down on these. These are authentic seats. See, these are the couches. Uh... We didn't call them seats. Yeah, couches. 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 Yeah, sorry. Uh, looking at the couches, uh, the one on the extreme left there would be Jim McDivitt's couch. He had two hand controllers, and I'll talk about those in a second. The center couch was J Dave Scott's couch. He was considered to be the command module pilot. And then the right-hand one was Rusty Swiker's, and he was the lunar module pilot. And that's how they would sit in there. Uh, usually when we did the altitude runs, I believe the commander would come in first and get in his seat, and then the lunar module pilot would come in and sit in his seat, and then, or couch, and then 
Dave Scott would be the last one in. In the middle. In, in the there. middle. And then we reverse that coming out. Uh -huh. And again, this is uh, this is a little bit harder to see, but the, I really want to talk about. Where is the, this setting at, Gary? That I don't know. It, okay. Uh, I just saw it on the internet, and it's just. It looks like a split. Target back room or something. Yeah. With the, it's a, it's they, a got, they got some nice. Uh, yeah. Shelves underneath the now drawers. the material itself is a a, a, a beta cloth uh, was impregnated with Teflon. Uh, they did not wear very well. So after during the Apollo Seven mission, we had them in there the whole time, and they ended up that uh, the fabric would break and and, and deteriorate, and they'd have to keep replacing that. And I think they replaced it several times on Apollo Seven. After that, they decided not to do that. So for ground checkout, that was replaced, and we had another set of couches, and they had actual metal backing. They sat on metal, and technicians would get a piece of foam uh, material wrapped in plastic, and they would lay on that, and they were in the, and then we would put these in at the very last time we had access to the command module before we rolled back. Uh, for launch. That's when we would install it. Now, them. right there, this, uh, I'm pointing to this yellow structure yeah. there, and then right above your head yeah. is another yellow knob. Now, those are a pair. There's one on the other. They're opposite side. They have those. The long, elongated with triangle one with uh, holes in it, that, if you pull on it, would release the seat pan, and it either could be folded down out of the way, or you could fold it back onto the back uh, rest. Now, the little lever right above my head was the lever you would pull, and then you could lower the calf pan back out of the way. Huh. And then the foot pans would just fold back up on it. So they could remove these things, uh, these couches, in orbit if they wanted to. But normally they were supposed to sleep underneath the couches, but I don't think they actually really did do mm -hmm. that because there was also – Container storage containers that were under the couches for what various things that they. Now, where'd the knob that you get? The knob is not that? there. It's on the headrest. Oh, okay. And we do have so, some pictures later. But look at this detail there. Uh, of course, they want it to be as light but as strong as possible. That's right. Yeah. On there, but what a uh, what an engineering <laughs> piece yes. of work in itself. Yes. There. And this actually was suspended off, off the deck by about three feet. And there was four vertical struts that came down from the ceiling right. that held the... Oh, so this wasn't attached to the floor at all? No, it was it actually not attached to the floor. It was suspended. Those are those the, that we see in the way on each That's side. That's true. There's four huh. of those. <laughs> uh, Man, wow. And then there's two underneath the couch that tie to the back wall that absorb shock laterally. Mm -hmm. Now the white area at the very top up there, that's where the the uh, the ball for the headrest is. They have a, 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 a arm that with the ball on the end and they would pull that and they could adjust that headrest up and down for their, they had suits on with their helmets or if they were just normal uh, attire that they would wear when they were going well, to the moon. Well, imagine the most important part of this in the couch is yeah. the Saturn V rocket ride yes, sir. and all of that that they're just being the shook question. around like yeah. a rag doll everybody said in yeah. that right Marty we got a question from someone staying curious with Gary Allgaier today to that picture for a second that would be me Mark <laughs> my question Gary when did the, uh, Jim McDivitt and, and, and Scott change seats because Scott would have to go into a uh, the commander's position to fly the command he would fly yes he would go into once the scott and mcdivitt were in the lunar module then dave scott would go over to the command module and he would operate the the command module until the uh they, they came back yeah. okay okay good all right now no. dave scott would have also and i'll get into this here we have the three hand controllers the, the one that looks like a box, that's the, called a translation hand controller. Oh, yeah. And that would be on Jim McDivitt's left arm. And on his right arm would be a rotation hand controller. Oh, so it does. Yeah. There's the... Now, this is a translation hand controller. It had, it's designed different. 
And what they would There's do. There's the other one just yeah, to show you. That's the rotation quick. hand controller. More like a joystick, people. Just like could, we just uh, see in a game console maybe. or in a cockpit. That's of a like uh, a, a TNT yeah. box to blow up yes. the, the Wiley e. Coyote. Now, what this, <laughs> what this thing, what this trans, translation hand controller did, if you pushed on it, that sent the spacecraft forward. If you pulled back on it backwards, then, and then it would go backwards. And then if you slid it to the left or to the right, that was moving the spacecraft horizontally left and right. And then it could go up and down. So that was your translations, which you needed for docking. Now this had one additional uh, purpose, and that is that hand controller during a, a launch. If the astronaut had to abort, he would take that and put his hand on it and he would rotate it counterclockwise, and that would start the ignition of the launch escape tower. Oh my gosh, the launch escape yeah. towers. Are now we that. had, uh, as a little side story, we were all out at the pad one day. When I got back to my office, I found out what had happened, and I guess we were really upset because this engineer from JSC, Johnson Space Center, and his buddy came down to the pad that one day, that day and somehow they were able to convince somebody to let them into the cockpit. And they were sitting in there, and the guy was sitting in the commander's seat. He was explaining to his buddy that, that what these levers did and so forth. And he ran up there and says, oh, yeah, this is the, uh, this is the handle that operates the launch escape tower. And he rotated it. And back in the firing room, there was an engineer sitting on console and saw the big red light come on said it had been triggered and they all panicked because oh, wow. that gentleman did not know if it was armed or not armed. Luckily it was not armed and he did not know that and if it had been armed we would have killed everybody out there that day and destroyed the whole pad. Wow. And so he is the only JSC engineer that was escorted off the Space Center and told he could never ever come back to Kennedy Space Center. Yeah, that's that, yeah. that's a great story there from Gary Allgaier. All yeah, right, yeah. we were all you upset about tell. that. I'd say very, yeah. very. Uh, Why well, you need these checks and balances? Okay. Let's go back to the translation controllers. One other thing I want to point out is you see, uh, let's get the pitch right there at the very end of the at the edge. You'll see a little lever. Uh, I don't know if Mark. Yeah, I, I I see the uh, like a a. a, a, a if it's, I do a small right there, that lever right there. Right, right there, yeah, yes. Kind of a slide yeah. back and forth lever. Right Those there. are locks. So when you're in orbit or going to the moon, they don't want to actually bump into that trans that controller and actually fire an engine. So they have a lockout device so they can lock it so it cannot be moved. Okay. And once again, this this uh, this triggers the hypergolic reaction control thrusters around the spacecraft. It does, yeah, the okay. RCS engines. All right, okay. now there's another. Now this is the rotation hand controller, which implies that it gives you roll, pitch, and yaw. Okay. All right, so that between the two, and again, the two, it looks like a little V on the end of it. Those, that's, that is the lockout. Oh, that's they, the lockout yeah, there. Yeah, they can lock out one side. Okay. I don't know which Two one. Two miniature barriers. Yeah. Of, uh, they can lock one side of it, and that will lock out maybe one of the systems on it, then they can have another one. That right there. Yeah, to, to keep right. them from doing an inadvertently uh, uh, bump of the throttle. Huh. Okay. Now, the commander has one of each. Now, the, ro the, the sh uh, command module pilot, uh, he only has one. He has a rotation hand controller. And you I don't know if that it right, shows right up here. Yet. It's on this. It'll be on if if Dave Scott's that sitting in it. it it'll be oh, on. Yeah, you see him left, right yeah. there. And he'll it'll be on his right hand arm. It's that hand for his, uh, rotation hand controller. Yeah. And the reason he only has one is his job is once they have uh, on the way back and they're re-entering the Earth's atmosphere, if the automatic system right landing right system fails, he has to manually. Uh, bring the spacecraft in on orientation wise and so what's above him is the hatch window and on that window there are some lines put on there and they'll have degrees on them and what he has to do is he takes that hand, rotation hand controller and he rotates this command module 
to match up to the Earth's curvature for re-entry. And they have to do it a couple of times because when they come in at such a high speed, they actually will come back up a little bit to cool off and then they'll make the big dive down. Huh. And so that's his job because the commander cannot look out that window, hatch window. So he has to do it himself. Amazing. Good so that's, detail. So that's his main uh, function there on reentry. Amazing. All right. Well, we're going to look at close ups here in the spacecraft. Uh, well, we might be blocking where those oh, yeah, are sure inside are. there. But yeah. oh, well, there, there's the green. I see the green right there. I'm pointing it's, to it's it. There's a little the hard green ball. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's the one that Martin's I have gonna... right here. This yeah. is the one that I have. Okay. And that's the green they one. They took that off. This is uh, was filmed on orbit, and you can see Dave Scott in the center and Rusty Swiker off in the background. See Actually, that window you were just talking that's about the window. above his head. And if you look up just to the left there of the, from the hand controller, you will see a little black disc floating around. I do. Head. Yeah, that was the, uh, they. They like to do that. They would throw it out and it right would, there's a black disc yeah, right, right there. there. Yeah. Just a, a zero G indicator, yes. or yeah. Okay. Yeah, just so that, that. Now this is Dave Scott's. Couch. Look at the seats, just like you talked yeah, about the and couch. You can see couch, couch, rather. <laughs> I'm getting to the bed. All right, here. couch. Uh, you can see that it, his knob is a gold knob. Right there. Yeah. Next to my right head. there. Yeah, above yeah. your head. That's just like you have there. Yeah, it's just like the that. one I have. All right. Yeah. Oh, cool. That's... So I, I I got this shot because I wanted to verify that it actually had flown. I know we put it in there. I was there the day we did mm -hmm. it. And so I just didn't want to make sh I wanted to make sure that after the, this was done in the O and C building in the chamber, and I just wanted to make sure that mm -hmm. it actually stayed in there till they launched. And then I also wanted to verify what happened to it after re re recovered from the, uh, the ocean. And then I looked on the video any pictures I could find from the San Diego uh, Museum that had that capsule. And there actually was a picture in there. Somebody had photographed, and it was they were back to gold anodized. Mm -hmm. And so that was why it was very important for me to talk to Rusty Swiker when he was here. And he gave you the him. information there. That was that's cool so space that's trivia. Fifty five years ago, we're celebrating Apollo yeah. nine, the important test of uh, this uh, uh, lunar module, no, tail number uh, three. Uh, George George Mueller, who was the NASA associate administrator, very important man in getting money on Capitol Hill, said, quote, Apollo 9 was as successful a flight as any of us could ever wish for, as well as being as successful as any of us has ever seen. This was truly uh, a great crew, cohesive crew. Uh, unfortunately, only Dave Scott went on to fly again. Really? Uh, um like we said, uh, certainly McDivitt could have been a moonwalker and commanded a, a flight. A nine would have put him in Q3 later to be the commander of 12. Okay, uh, but he went on to a desk job and a bigger paycheck. Uh, like Marty mentioned, who worked on this, this is the only vehicle still ever built to work in the vacuum of space yeah and land on another world yeah. and lift off that other world yeah. and and never allow could it could it ever re-enter the earth again because uh, yeah. it would burn up so uh never has been no one's ever done that yet no, so. and it is what it actually were three of the lunar modules that re-entered the earth's atmosphere and burned up okay they're, they're, mm. what limb one uh marty and then and then uh apollo mm -hmm. nine and then Apollo 13. Yeah, but obviously it wasn't crude at the time. Yeah, yeah. But the two. That picture I was showing you, yeah. Wikipedia says that's Apollo 9, uh, but it can't be because they have a docking hatch. Okay. Well, let's look at some pictures, some that you're familiar with as we celebrate this mission 55 years ago. Uh, so there's a, the only picture I've seen of the astronaut taking out their own American flag. <laughs> All right. Uh, looks like McDivitt grabbed that on the way out the door and said, hey, I want to hold this out there. Yeah. Uh, but uh, God bless them all. Look at the Saturn V rocket there. I'd say Marty and Gary both know exactly where they're standing. Yeah. Off the side of the road. Side of the road there. Saturn V in the back. One of the epic images of this, of space history. 
uh, the two vehicles docked there together. Uh, that is David Scott uh, outside of the uh, the hatch. So they dared open the hatch that basically killed the Apollo 1 astronauts because well, it couldn't open up. Not this, and they had such confidence in it that they could open and close it. Well, this is not the hatch that was on Apollo 1. Apollo 1 was a totally different design. Yeah, but I'm, I'm saying, yeah, yeah I'm okay. just saying that they redesigned the hatch redesigned the and hatch. have such confidence in it that, oh, that yeah. oh, yeah, we'll open it and close it five times to do stand-up yes. EVAs there. So uh, that, that was a, uh, you know, an engineering feat. Another great photo of the lunar module looking down the ladder uh, section of it there over the uh, probably the Pacific. There's a docking picture there. That's kind of out of sequence. We talked about that there again. If you see, uh, you can't tell if it's the moon or Earth. Of course, that's the Earth because of the blue thin line. But the probe down over the uh, uh, landing leg with the ladder. Do you want to? talk about the other that's one prior to that since we already have it here i don't know this could have been i don't know what the, what? Mission, the picture before oh, that one yeah was, sure yeah uh, on several occasions we got a call from jsc that says we have an issue with with one of the parachutes or some rigging and so we would have to come out of the chamber and sitting in this special stand and then we would take the forward heat shield off which is very complicated. And then we had to go in there and examine whatever they wanted to examine. Uh, we found it was always correct. And then we would put the forward heat shield back on. And this is something I did not like to do because we are messing around with the parachutes and the drogue chutes and the pilot chutes. Uh -huh. So it was a tedious little thing. You can see we built a little tent enclosure uh, oh, I see you're working down here above your yeah, head there. Yeah. 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 yeah if I make it smaller, maybe you can yeah. see the technicians the technician there. right there. Yeah. Yeah. You built that just to do this test. Just huh? to do, well, it wasn't a test. It was just I to mean, go in there and verify inspection. a configuration. One was a land, uh, the, the rigging of the parachute cord, and then the other one was has to do with mm. the, uh, the drogue chutes. All right. That's a great, great, great insight there. Yeah. Great picture, Gary. Thank you for asking me to go back there. Uh, many of you have seen this picture. We're going to show some pictures that you haven't seen off of Flickr. has the Apollo uh, film imagery. Once again, this is celluloid film, no digital. The, the photo When you're watching the Flickr and you see all the overexposed pictures, and you know, like this picture in the backdrop here, I didn't enhance at all. I could put some contrast and some blue in that ocean, but that's right out of the... The, the soup, so to speak, of the processing. Uh, but, um, uh, yeah, that's kind of an unusual photograph of Rusty out on doing his EVA uh, test in the backpack. Now, when you see Dave Scott uh, on his uh, uh, stand-up EVAs, he does not have the uh, personal life support system pack. Rusty was, this was the first and only test of that. Uh, until Apollo 11. They did not test this on Apollo uh, 10. They had such no. confidence in this hour-long test that Schweikert did. There uh, is, again, Dave Scott uh, uh, with another red helmet, but Dave does not have a backpack yeah. on. He is His life support system is coming from a hose uh, attached in there, but this is a picture I many of you've never seen before. And it's, it looks like he's just hanging off the edge there, just this, checking out the view, like looking at a waterfall yeah, or something. This picture was taken by Rusty Schweikert from the inside the lunar module. Right. Okay. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Rusty's inside the lunar module, or uh, uh, looking out, and beside him is McDivitt probably, yeah. uh, and they're looking through the windows there. And there's the one of the first the command module view, the famous hatch there that they were opening and closing. A lot of light coming in there. Uh, and then we're going to see some classic pictures there of the inspection. You got the antennas there over the earth. And this is the background that we chose today for a green screen. Uh, yeah, Marty. Bill Whiting is asking, why the red helmet? We'd like to dif differentiate between a commander and a regular uh, lunar manager pilot. That's the way they did it. Eventually, they ended up putting red stripes 
on the commander's suits when they were walking on the moon. Yeah, well, they didn't do it on eleven or ten, no. uh, and or or twelve. They uh, fourteen was the first one to yeah. have the stripes on there, but uh, uh, but uh, also may have had something to do with Rusty's red hair <laughs> on there. But good question, Bill. The uh, lunar module went a hundred and ten miles away from its home uh, base there. Uh, and on this day, this picture was taken 55 years ago today, March 7th, 1969, on the fifth day of the event, was the key event uh, of the entire mission, the separation rendezvous of the Lunar Module and Command Module. It was the first time, again, that space travelers had flown in a vehicle that could not take them home. Uh, they entered early. They uh, did everything right. They went. They throttled up the over the next few hours. McDivitt fired the Lem's descent engine at several throttle settings. All right. Now, the descent engine that was going to land on the moon, and then that was trashed. The the, the descent stage become the uh, launch pad for the ascent half that has yes. their engine its own engine in it, hypergolic. There's the nozzle for it. But why was this test and firing several times of the descent engine important, Gary? Well, it was important, you know, for the actual moon mission. But it ended up being, at the time, they didn't know this, but actually it became very important on Apollo 13. Because during the, after the tank, uh, had the oxygen tank had exploded, they needed to make a course correction because they were not on a return to Earth free uh, trajectory. They had gotten off that already. They had done a mid course to take them off that. And so they needed to get back on that free return because there was no power in the service module to, uh, at that time, to, to light the engine off and get, get them to come back. So what they did is they used the the lunar module descent engine to put them in back onto a free return trajectory. All right. So after they put it through its paces, Gumdrop and uh, uh, after McDivitt and Schweikert returned to Gumdrop. Okay. Now they they Dell did all this about two hundred miles above the Earth. The furthest that uh, the Spider got away, lunar module was one hundred fifteen miles. But then. They got the two astronauts back in gumdrop there with David Scott. And then uh, 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 Spider was jettisoned. Its engine was fired to deplete uh, its... They wanted to simulate a liftoff again from the lunar surface. And it climbed to th uh, 4,300 miles. Uh, Apogee. Apogee. And then uh, they refired it to bring it into the uh, Pacific Ocean, probably. The only major lunar system not tested was the landing radar that couldn't be done. So on March 7th, 1969, they spent all day doing this test. There's how it looked as, as um, David Scott was greeting it coming back. Uh, I, Marty was an electrical engineer on lunar module, not a structural engineer. But I did ask him, I'll bet. Pictures like these were just analyzed to death of how everything held together, right, Marty? What's your pit comment on that? Yeah, I was not aware of that at the time, but you know, looking back, I'm sure that's true, Mark. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they spent another four days in orbit, almost five days in orbit, just doing a lot of Earth orbit observation and having a lot of fun, I think. They had some experiments on board. Now I'm going to show you some pictures. You, that's the classic shot of Jim McDivitt. Uh, that was taken, but this is looking at the Flickr uh, actual rolls of film, Hasselblad film that was taken. This is the only one that's really in good focus. There's Dave Scott looking, uh, shielding his eyes and looking all cool there. There is uh, McDivitt again, floating around. They All these shots inside the cabin, very few of them are in focus. Uh, they never set the house of blood. There's Rusty having a good time. The focus is set about two feet from the camera, and he's about six feet away mm -hmm. uh, in there. So a uh, uh, lot of fun looking at these pictures of these guys. 
There's one I'll bet you've never seen before, McDivitt and Schweikert in the background. Focus, focus, focus. I've, you know, being a professional photographer all my life, I say one of the greatest breakthroughs in the modern age of cameras is autofocus. Yeah. <laughs> I, I lost a lot of good pictures of Brilliant. politicians and sports figures and, and action on the field because you had to manually focus that. Yes, and you did. and uh, uh, that, that's a big change in today's. There's all the guys there. Like I said, Rusty's 88 on the left. David Scott's going to be 93 in June. And uh, Jim McDivitt lived to the ripe old age of 93. Uh, didn't find his shaver up there. Yeah. It doesn't look like in, in his days in space up there. Um, we honor our Apollo astronauts with bronzed handprints at Space View Park. There's McDivitt's. Uh, this was part that was done in 99, so we don't have some astronauts there. Uh, yes, Marty. Well, you have uh, comments and, and, and a question. Uh, Mark Bell said, <coughs> excuse me, uh, oh, they needed an extra call sign when Rusty was out. It was Red Rover was the call sign. Yes. Yeah. That, that was, was a, his call sign. sign. Who, who offered that? that? Uh, Mark Dell, this is Mark Dell, if I can ask her, right? It's his well, first time you. watching, he just found us today. And, Good. Uh, and Mark, yeah, Red Rover was his, his call sign. Yeah, yeah Mark Uzak uh, is asking, well, he's asking me, I guess, <laughs> but why were there two different colors out of skin on the Aslan stage? Well, you had the aluminum, and you also had um, an Inconel shield. So the Inconel was black, and then aluminum obviously was aluminum color. And you yes. also you also had um, um, Capcom also in Mylar being exposed. Silver Mylar, yeah. yeah. Inconel is uh, uh, nickel. Uh, Inconel is three elements uh, merged together, I think, on there. But uh, uh, good questions. Great space history today, folks. Uh, like uh, like you don't get anywhere else on the internet. Uh, or get to see Jim McDivitt's handprints that you can go out to Space View Park, the only place in the world uh, you can put your hands on top of his. And by the way, those names there, Larry Ellis, Walt Murphy, uh, yeah. all given us $100 to put their name up there. Uh, occasionally we see people that I know or that you might know yeah, up Larry there. Larry Ellis I do very well. Mary Ellis up Larry, there? Yes. Oh, all right, yeah. sweet. Larry yeah. Ellis? Yeah. What Larry Ellis do? He was in the project office eventually, but uh, before that, I don't know what system engineer he did. Hmm. Uh, Interesting. That's the space yeah. history set there. There's yeah. the gentleman uh, in 2009 at San Diego Space Museum there. I can see in the lower right-hand corner, probably one of their last reunions there. Uh, all looking well fit. Uh, 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 you know, uh, Rusty Schweiker is just an energetic 88-year-old for yes. sure. Yes, he is. Well, let's look at some of the stuff you can buy with your money. This is an Apollo 9 Mission Guidance and Navigation Analyzer. This is on both sides, and it's like a wheel that shows you where we are at the timeline of the mission. Mm -hmm. What should I be doing? Kind of a quick little reminder. Of course, they had spiral-bound notebooks that they took up to space with them. Uh, so far, three bids of $70 on this. Now, Gary, if you say I'd like that, but I'm only going to go 200 bucks. You go to the website right now. You put your will to bid two hundred, but if the bid only gets up to one fifty, all right, or one twenty-five, you're going to get it for the next highest bid, twenty-five dollar level, one fifty. So though you're willing to go two hundred, you might get it for one fifty. That's how it works there. Then we got Jim McDivitt signed photograph there. I think we look at that up close. There we are. Those analyzers right there's the wheel that that you read the data on there. These are way cool. Raytheon uh, put these out. They were the guidance and navigation people. Uh, oh, I didn't do the, the, the uh, oh yeah, I've got a picture of the more close up of the McDivitt. Should go for two to $300. That's the estimate by Chuck Jeffrey, our auctioneer and board member. Now, patches are something I don't pretend to know anything about. The only thing I know about patches is if they're cloth backing and not plastic, like this is plastic right there that you might see on there. That's plastic on the back. If it's all cloth, then you know it's from that era, like it's the real, 70s. It's a real patch. Yeah, it's a real patch because the knockoffs have, have uh, in the plastic. 60s and 70s have 
that on there. So, but these are both special. Let me go forward here again, bring that up and consult my notes. Um, on the left, the, the light blue is a rare, this is from the website, should go for 200 to $400. This is a rare variant of the Apollo 9 crew patch. It's three and a quarter inches. Rusty Schweikert also wore this variant version patch on one of his flight suits on the USS Guadalcanal after the Apollo 15 recovery. In examples of this variant were carried on the mission as souvenirs alongside the other version of the crew patch. He apparently was on the Guadalcanal for the recovery mission of 15. He wasn't on 15. Uh, it's excellent to mint condition. Uh, so uh, now the one on the right is a vintage patch from the 1960s. All right. Um, and it's called a souvenir patch. Apart from the different font and twill background, the easiest way to tell this from the crew version is that the escape tower of the Saturn V points to S of Scott in this version, to the mm -hmm. S, all right? The crew patches that are worth hundreds of dollars uh, have a little different font, and these are just given to the crew in packs of 100 or something like that for them to take to space, and they actually went to space. Those can get you a lot of money. So, uh, so I forget the patch guy's name, but there is a space patch website that is uh, just uh, the Bible. Here is the McDivitt signed up there. Been great to have him sign something like that before he passed away. Like we go out and see astronaut Heidi Piper today signing things. Lot number 89 is eight vintage Apollo 9 spacecraft photos. All of them have the blue stamp on the back that they were from uh, the Johnson Space Center labs. Uh, you have breakfast with the astronauts, all eight by ten. And, you know, that should go for two to three hundred dollars. That's twenty five dollars. A vintage photograph there. This is a lot for sale. Uh, Jim, Mc what a cool photo of Jim McDivitt. Now. What mission is he on? Jim McDivitt on this. You can tell by the helmet. Oh, that's a, a Mercury. I mean, a Gemini. Yep, that'd be a Gemini helmet. Yeah. Which are so strange, Gary, because when they sit down, the helmet goes up to, about to their eye level. Yeah. You know, uh, th there was no neck to it, so to speak. As you see, his his chin's covered up there. When you sit down, his nose kind of gets covered up. Uh, when when you sit. They down. had a strap that they could on their chest that they could pull mm -hmm. that would lower that down so that they, you could get a position like this that you see. I would love to own that. Don't yeah. know what the bright source is behind, maybe just a lamp. Yeah. And there's another shot. These are these are two hundred dollar autographs easy, but it's personalized to Richard, which shaves the price off a little bit there. There's a rusty Schweiker. Excellent uh suit room fitting there. I think he's adjusting the mic microphone and, and see see on the uh, patch where the tower isn't as high up uh, to the s on that so uh, but you can own that for a couple hundred dollars and there's one of his uh, baby pictures uh, <laughs> chosen as an astronaut no mission chosen yet that's why there's not one on the patch again personalized but this is one of the uh, uh, one of the um, Pioneers of the space age is, is, yeah. what I'm, is what I'm trying to say there. So there's Rusty uh, just in November with uh, uh, Anita Truex and uh, some of our friends in the background there. I, I, I recognize on the left uh, uh, Gabriel Rothblatt of the National Space Society. I forget the lady's name in the center there, but she supports us financially at auctions and stuff. And there I am with can't get away with me having a grab shot there with a uh, astronaut, an Apollo astronaut, really good guy. Asteroid Day is what his shirt says. He doesn't really want to talk about Apollo Nine. No, you want to he, get to his heart. You talk about Asteroid Asteroids. Day and the B612 Asteroid Committee and the uh, and the Association of Space Explorers that he was one of the founders of and the definitive 
source of human beings who have orbited the Earth, the only way you can belong to the Association of Space Explorers, Gary, is to been in space. Orbit the Earth. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They do let so they do let the Karma knots in. Oh, do they? The suborbital okay. guys. All right. And he was fascinated with our women's gallery that now has 77 women up there. We had to reconfigure it. We, not uh, uh, Nick Enix, our collection manager, spent last week just moving all the pictures around so we could make room for more of the ladies. And he was fascinated with that, took a whole panorama of it oh, to yeah. show right. in an ASE conference. There he is, looking good. We thank Mark Usiak for watching. And, and Marty says he'll give you a tour of Lem 9. Uh, when you're in town, it'll just cost you a lunch at the Moon Hut. I didn't say that. No, oh, okay. <laughs> That'll cost me lunch at the Moon Hut. I'm as, I'm your agent, Marty. <laughs> All right, I got to get my cut. <laughs> yes, sirree. International Women's Day. Uh, Bill Whiting knows that. So is Gary Gerald, Carlton Bailey, Robert Law, Dave Stangy, and his granddaughter are watching today. Okay. Uh, they'll go back here to, to Rusty there. Uh, Doug Forrest, we were showing off your photo the other day to um, uh, Don Thomas. His not his photo, his sketch of Endeavor, sketch masterpiece pencil of it. Cynthia Rossi's watching. Cliff Watson, Steve Jokums, Clyde Lewis. Thank you for being a new viewer. Mark Thiel, thank you, Mark, for finding us. Uh, we will hope that you stay curious. Gary Allgaier is one of our most knowledgeable and popular guests here. I just pulled him in on the fly today, and that's that's where the beauty of our program has gotten is where we become a we have a relationship with you and others, and and I've even learned enough that I can ask you an intelligent <laughs> question once in a while. You do a good job. Uh, well, it's because I pay attention to you, national treasures, like. Gary Allgaier and Marty is one there. So, so thank you all for watching today. Let's uh, International Women's Day is March eighth. We will talk about some women in space, uh, some of our favorite women that we've met along the way, uh, personally here at our museum that have done a lot of good things for us. So, Marty, one last photograph from uh, Apollo nine, a picture that many of you have never seen before. I'll bet this gorgeous picture of the thin blue line that is the only border that should matter on this this fragile earth we heard it again from another astronaut heidi piper out there saying that when you look at the earth you just can't believe how fragile we look out That's there so true. in yeah. space and this blue line goes away whoo we're we're history folks yeah. so uh gary allgaier thank you again for sharing for your knowledge me. of us on here well, you are always a, an enhancement of our program in spreading the word. One of the most excellent docents the museum's ever had here, uh, usually here on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So if yeah. you're planning your trip, uh, Gary would be happy to show you around there. So, Marty, thank you for an excellent job on Streamlabs today. Anything we need to button up over there? Yep, we're good to go. Well, great. And... We appreciate everybody watching today, supporting our nonprofit, the American Space Museum. We, of course, have an important auction to sustain us this Saturday. So go to our website and start bidding now. Bid till it hurts, says Chuck, a bid again auction. So thank you all for embracing us. We have numbers are up because you are telling other people to stay curious with us. So I'm Mark Marquette saying I can't wait to see you tomorrow to celebrate International Women's Day, all to bridge the space between us.